This week on the Green Left News Podcast, police crack down on Palestine protesters, strong results for progressive parties in Queensland's local government elections, and the biggest terrorist attack in modern Russia. This podcast was recorded on stolen land. Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Isaac Nellist and I'm excited to bring you the latest news from this week. We've had a bit of a time between episodes over Easter, so this will be a bit of a bumper episode to catch up with what you've missed. Um, But before we get to the news, we're excited to announce that the full conference agenda for Eco-Socialism 2024 has been released with an exciting list of new speakers. So the fifth annual Eco-Socialism conference is taking place in Borloo or Perth over June 28 to 30 and will feature speakers from across the Indo-Pacific, including from Singapore, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Pakistan, as well as Egypt, the United States, Ireland and Palestine. It will also feature a range of Australia-based speakers, including local activists from Disrupt Burrup Hub, queer liberation campaigners and Palestinian activists. You can find the full agenda, tickets and more information about all of the incredible speakers at ecosocialism.org.au. So hope to see you all there. Now the Easter long weekend did not stop thousands from rallying for Palestine in what was the 25th week of continuous protests in some cities. And smaller actions also took place in smaller towns and regional cities. The rally in Gadigal or Sydney reiterated demands for a permanent ceasefire, an end to the siege of Gaza and no ground invasion of Rafa. And the Council of Civil Liberties President Lydia Shelley spoke about the arrests of 18 people a week earlier at the port blockade directed at the Israeli Zim shipping line. Shelley called on protesters to support a petition against New South Wales' draconian anti-protest laws, and you can find that petition in the podcast description. In Nam or Melbourne, speakers highlighted that the protest also marked Land Day, which has been commemorated since 1976 as Palestinian resistance to Israel's land theft. The protesters also expressed solidarity with Egyptians, Yemenis and Iraqis defending Gaza, and waved olive branches. On March 29, so a few days earlier, a community iftar was held outside Prime Minister Anthony Albanese's electoral office in Marrickville as part of the permanent peace vigil, and it attracted hundreds of people over several hours. An iftar was also organised on the Gold Coast on March 30, with non-Muslims fasting in solidarity with Muslims who are marking Ramadan, and then breaking their fast together at sunset. <laughs> Anti-Zionist Jewish group, the Zedek Collective, together with Jews Against the Occupation 48, held a sit-in at Central Station in Gadigal on March 22 to show solidarity with Palestine. They lit candles and recited the Jewish morning prayer of Kaddish for all the people who have died in the ongoing genocide. Shula Kirovsky wrote in Green Left that we came together in the knowledge that our liberation must be collective and interconnected and that the safety and freedom of Jews and Palestinians are inextricably linked. Now, briefly mentioned before the Port Botany blockade of Zim shipping on March 24, which was violently broken up by New South Wales police with 17 people arrested. Among those arrested were Maritime Union of Australia Sydney Branch Secretary Paul Keating, MUA organiser Shane Reside, and other MUA delegates. More than 300 people had assembled at Port Botany to delay the shift change, which was successful, but police quickly became violent and forced protesters off the streets. The action was called by the Palestine Justice Movement Sydney and Trade Unionists for Palestine. As many listeners will already know, Zim has a history of supplying the Israeli Defence Forces occupation of Palestine and has made statements supporting the current genocide. The arrests in Port Botany followed arrests of three activists at the Gadigal rally on March 23, who were arrested for spraying red-coloured water near police as part of a die-in.
There were strong results for progressive candidates in the Queensland local government elections on March 16. In Mianjin or Brisbane, the Greens increased their representation on council from one to two councillors and won significant swings towards them. In Gimoy or Cairns, the new progressive team Community First won almost a quarter of the vote in some divisions. And Community First is an alliance of community activists, including from Socialist Alliance and the Greens, as well as independent and First Nations activists. Renee Lees, who ran for Community First and is a member of Socialist Alliance, told Green Left the campaign was energising and that we feel like we've had an impact and we can do more. Former Brisbane Greens councillor Jonathan Shuranganathan, who ran for mayor, described the outcome as easily the best Greens result we've ever had in Brisbane at the local government level. Some have pointed out, including Emerald Moon from the Serious Danger podcast, that compulsory preferential voting would have tipped over a lot more seats to the Greens. Thousands joined the Bob Brown Foundation's nationwide March for Forests on March 24, which aimed to ramp up pressure on labour to stop the logging of native forests. Protests and marches were organised in New South Wales forest towns of Bellingen, Bundjalung, Lismore and Bega, to Victoria's Kyneton as well as Gadigal, Corneyerta or Adelaide and Ngunnawal, Canberra and Mulubimba, Newcastle. A huge protest was organised in Nipaluna or Hobart before the Tasmania election. Sean O'Shaughnessy from the Bob Brown Foundation told Green Left the Labour Party needs to get off the fence and start responding to clear demands from the overwhelming majority of Australians to end native forest logging. <laughs> Refugees and supporters gathered outside the electorate office of Claire O'Neill, who's the Minister for Home Affairs in Oakley, Nam, on March 20, for a three-day sit-in. They demanded permanent residency and showed solidarity for the thousands of refugees living on temporary visas, some for more than 11 years. Kurdish-Iranian refugee Fahima Asghari told Green Left that Claire O'Neill has not once come out and spoken to us and asked her to do something for refugees. The sit-in was organised by the 12,000 Captive Souls Group, a reference to the estimated 12,000 refugees currently on bridging visas. It was supported by the Refugee Action Collective Victoria. And Palestinian refugee Adnan Mansour told a public forum in Nam on March 18 that federal labour must start seeing Palestinians as humans. He contrasted the welcome given to Ukrainian refugees with the treatment of Palestinians at a forum organised by the Refugee Action Collective. As we previously reported, Australia had granted the suddenly as we previously reported, Australia had granted visas, then suddenly cancelled them for a number of Palestinians, leaving them stranded in various airports. Some of these have subsequently been reinstated. Jane Favero from the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre told the forum that the government's approach to refugees depends on their skin colour and religion. David Glanz from RAC spoke about the situation for refugees in Nauru, PNG and in Indonesia who are not allowed to find safety here. He agreed that protests can be effective, citing Labor's back down on UNRWA funding. The New South Wales Boundaries Commission said on March 13 it does not support Sydney's Inner West Council de-amalgamating. And the Minister for Local Government, Ron Honig, agreed, saying there is a compelling evidence that the business case presented by Council will cost the community more money than it saves. However, Rochelle Porteous from Residents for for De-Amalgamation said Labor's rejection of the Labor-run council's business case is not a surprise because the case was inadequate. She says residents are furious. They voted 62.5% for De-Amalgamation and once again their voice has been ignored. Two-thirds of residents voted to demerge the Giant Inner West Council in a 2021 poll conducted by the New South Wales Electoral Commission. And Pip Hinman from Residents for De-Amalgamation said the Labor-run Inner West Council claims it has done what it had to do to respect the residents' vote to demerge, but it hasn't. She said Labor's decision to accept a faulty New South Wales Boundaries Commission verdict based on a faulty Inner West Council de-amalgamation case is a kick in the teeth for the Inner West. At a statewide members' meeting on March 21, the Victorian branch of the Australian Nurses and Midwives Federation unanimously rejected Labor's enterprise bargaining offer and decided to apply to the Fair Work Commission for a protected action ballot. 
The union heard progress on negotiations for the nurses and midwives Victorian public se sector single interest employers enterprise agreement from 2024 to 2028 and the current EBA expires on April 30. Nurses from Nam, Geelong, Ballarat, Bendigo, Warrnambool, Shepparton, Mildura and Tarragon joined the meeting and union members expressed their anger and disappointment at the government's offer, which only included a 3% pay rise and an allowance rise of about $1,500 a year for full-time employees. Many said they felt used and undervalued. A follow-up meeting will be held in late April or early May. And the Fair Work Commission announced on March 15 a long overdue pay rise for aged care workers working in the private sector. Overall, wages will rise between 7 to 28% based on the classification, which is an increase of about $21 to $32.50 an hour. The low-waged insecure work in the industry meant many residents experienced poor outcomes. The final report of the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety recommended in 2020 that a significant pay rise was necessary, not just to retain staffing levels, but to attract new staff into the workforce. The decision means home care workers receive a significant pay rise, but indirect care workers, including maintenance, laundry, cleaning and catering staff, only get a 3 to 7% pay rise. Carolyn Smith, who's the aged care director for the United Workers Union, said the failure to fully recognise support workers for the vital work they do in aged care is greatly disappointing for our members. In the wake of the failed voice to parliament referendum, Gunai Gunjitmara and Jabrurong Independent Senator Lydia Thorpe has received cross-bench backing for her call on Labour to implement the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody's recommendations. Her open letter to Labour demanded an end to the removal of First Nations children and said the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Human Rights Commission should be funded properly to ensure the recommendations are acted on. The latest Closing the Gap report, which was released in January, showed the rates of First Nations suicide, incarceration and children in out-of-home care are worsening and deaths in custody rates are at their highest point in more than a decade with at least 558 First Nations people killed in custody since the 1991 Royal Commission, including four deaths this year. And traditional owners from the Beedaloo Basin and Torres Strait told their stories of resistance against the fossil fuel industry at an Our Islands, Our Home event in Gadigal or Sydney. Despite heat waves, bushfires, cyclones, coral bleaching and floods, Australia continues to extract and export coal and gas. Traditional owners have, have been resisting extraction on country for decades, and now a growing movement is pushing back against the fossil fuel lobby. The audience was told how to stop coal and gas companies from destroying First Nations people's lands. And First Nations people and supporters, including unionists, began a 400 kilometre peace walk against the AUKUS military alliance on March 18. They walked from Port Kembla to Ngunnawal or Canberra, as part of the Peace Walkers Against Orcus, which was organised by Uncle Winniata Peru, Beyond Uranium Canberra, the Australian Student Environment Network and the Independ Independent and Peaceful Australia Network, New South Wales. The Peace Walk followed a union and community speak out in Port Kembla Heritage Park on March 17, which was organised by the Australia Nuclear Free Alliance. And the campaign to free renowned Russian sociologist and anti-war activist Boris Kogolitsky from a Russian prison is growing in support. The petition was launched on March 11 by the Boris Kogolitsky International Solidarity Campaign and has been signed by more than 8,000 people, including recently by Australian Greens politicians Larissa Waters, Max Chandler Matha and Jenny Leong, as well as National Tertiary Education Union General Secretary Damien Cahill, and Geelong Trades Hall Council President Zita Henderson. They join Socialist Alliance councillors Sue Bolton and Sarah Hathaway, National Tertiary Education Union branch presidents Jonathan Strauss from James Cook University and Nick Rema from the University of Sydney. And other prominent names on the petition are former British Labour Party leader Jeremy Corbyn, French left leader Jean-Luc Mélenchon, uh, Naomi Klein, Kohei Saito, Patrick Bond and many others. 
Kagalitsky's appeal is expected to be heard in early May, and you can sign the petition at the link in the podcast description or by going to freeboris.info. You can also read Greenleaf's interview with Boris's daughter, Ksenia Kagalitskia, at our website. Now let's hear what's happening around the world. As the holy month of Ramadan began on March 10, Palestinians in Gaza face starvation and a looming Israeli ground assault on the southern border city of Rafah, where 1.4 million people have been forced to shelter. Israel continues its campaign to starve the population and prevent food aid from being brought into Gaza. Early in the war, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant said Israel was imposing a complete siege of Gaza that meant no electricity, no food and no water. The New York Times reported on March 19 that the Integrated Food Security Phase Classification found that famine is imminent in Gaza and on the verge of a major acceleration of deaths and malnutrition. 1.1 million Palestinians face catastrophic food shortages and Israel is also blocking access to other goods including medical equipment as it continues its bombardment with US-made bombs, artillery shells and other weapons. In Canada, the notorious Community Industry Response Group, which is the secretive tactical arm of the British Columbia Royal Canadian Mounted Police, which has been deployed extensively against Indigenous land defenders, is being now deployed against the Palestinian Solidarity Movement. The RCMP, a Senior Media Relations Officer, confirmed this expanded deployment saying the CRRG has been deployed to pro-Hamas demonstrations to support the police. Now, this is a racist, anti-Palestinian and Islamophobic framing, as Green Left's Canada correspondent Jeff Shantz explained that the demonstrations across Canada have focused on solidarity with Palestinians and an end to Israeli assaults on Gaza, and have not in any way been pro-Hamas. The CIRG has also been deployed against anti-logging protesters, trans rights protesters, and anti-homelessness protests. The Abolish CIRG Coalition, along with the BC Civil Liberties Association and the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, has demanded the Canadian and BC governments disband the CIRG. In San Francisco, which is a city known for having a progressive image, has passed two propositions to increase police powers on March 5. This represents the erosion of police accountability reforms that were won after the 2020 Black Lives Matter protests against police violence after the murder of George Floyd. The city has employed more police, raised their salaries and protected them from accountability over corruption and violence against civilians. Politicians are relying on tough on crime messaging to increase police funding despite uh, crime figures declining. The only way to stop police racism, violence and criminality and have true accountability is to rebuild mass public action to stop the pro-cop pushback. At least 139 people have been confirmed dead following a terrorist attack carried out on Moscow's Crocus City Hall in Russia on March 22. But Russian leftists are warning that Vladimir Putin's government's response is more frightening than the terrorist attack itself. ISIS has claimed responsibility for the attack which is one of the worst in modern-day Russia. But despite this, it took Russian President Vladimir Putin three days to refer to the four suspects arrested on the day of the attack as radical Islamists. He made no reference to ISIS, instead hinting that Ukraine and the West were behind the attack. Russian leftists believe Putin will seek to use the terrorist attack to strengthen his own regime of terror, both in Ukraine and at home. Russian left group No War said the tragedy will be used to justify sending hundreds of thousands of newly mobilized soldiers to the meat grinder in Ukraine. And leftist website Postle or After wrote that there is no doubt that the terrorist attack will be used to justify further crackdowns, the adoption of new repressive laws, the escalation of violence in, in Ukraine, and possibly a new wave of mobilization. It said this is why the state's reaction can be more frightening than the terrorist attack itself. Putin's response is similar to the one taken by Western governments after terrorist attacks, with the so-called war on terror used to justify authoritarian repressive policies. Socialist Party of Malaysia Deputy President S. Arachelvin, or Arul, 
recently spoke with Green Left about the new hope for reviving left unity with the People's Party of Malaysia, following a recent change in its leadership. He said Malaysia needs a strong left coalition because politics is dominated by a dangerous racial and religious politics shared by the capitalist parties. He said neither the so-called unity government between the Barisan Nasional and the Pakatan Harapan coalitions or the Islamic Party opposition are interested in workers' issues or in restoring elections for local governments, which were banned in the 1960s to stop the left from advancing at that level. Other urgent issues are the need for better public health care, minimum wages and age pensions. And a rule said these three issues are being drowned out by the constant talk of the three R's, race, religion and royalty. You can watch the full interview with Arul on the Green Left website. The Australia West Papua Association has condemned the brutal torture of a West Papuan man by Indonesian troops in Yahukimo in the Papua's highlands. A video of the man's torture was circulated on social media, showing soldiers in Indonesian national military uniforms beating him and slashing him with a bayonet as he stood in a barrel of water. Australia West Papua Association spokesperson Joe Collins said on March 22 that one can only imagine the fear and terror the Papuan man must feel at this brutal torture being inflicted on him. In an article published by the Asia Pacific Report, Australian-based West Papuan activist Ronnie Carini wrote, wrote, We must confront this grim truth that what we witnessed is not an isolated incident, but a glaring demonstration of the deep-seated racism and systematic persecution ravaging West Papuans every single day. He wrote that these videos are just the latest chapter in a long history of atrocities inflicted upon Papuans in the name of suppressing their cries for freedom. Now, Indonesian troops may be emboldened in their persecution of West Papuans after Prabowo Subianto, a former general in the Suharto military regime, was elected president of Indonesia on February 14. Prabowo and his vice presidential running mate Gibran Rakabuming uh, who was President Joko Widodo, or Jokowi, son, secured about 58% of the popular vote in the first round. Indonesians struggled to make sense of the result, with in all four direct presidential elections held since Indonesia's democratic reformasi movement brought Zahardo's new order dictatorship to an end, no presidential candidate has won an absolute majority in the first round. In the weeks since the election, there has been more and more evidence of widespread, systematic and structured electoral fraud. During the previous presidential period of Jokowi from 2019, he united most political parties and business elites, ensuring the pass passing of legislation that intensified exploitation of human and natural resources while removing safeguards and providing uh, concessions to domestic and foreign capital investors. At the same time, Social movements were repressed to levels not seen since the dictatorship. Indonesian researcher Rebecca Meckelberg, who will be speaking at Eco-Socialism 2024, argues that this coordinated plan to engage in massive and systematic election fraud can be understood as a logical next step in the consol consolidation of the politico-business elite's control over structural institutions of power. And 25 years after Hugo Chavez took office and began the Bolivarian Revolution in Venezuela, United States officials have still not tired, have still not tired of dreaming up new plots to overthrow the country's government. Venezuela has long been a target for U.S. intervention because of its efforts to build an alternative model to neoliberal capitalism. And now with the next Venezuelan presidential election set for July 28, the Joe Biden administration is gearing up for another regime change push. President Nicolas Maduro is running for re-election as the candidate of the United Socialist Party of Venezuela and the broader Great Patriotic Pole Coalition. He has built his campaign around a program referred to as the Seven Transformations, proposing new initiatives in economic modernization, asserting national sovereignty, safety and security, ensuring social rights, political participation, the environment and geopolitics. These aim to maintain the pro-poor socialist orientation of the country while countering the impact of crippling US sanctions. Now you can read more about all of these stories that we've talked about today, plus videos, detailed analysis and book and music reviews at greenleft.org.au. 
If you've enjoyed this podcast, please consider becoming a Green Left supporter today from $5 a month and donating to our fighting fund to help us continue reporting on workers, climate and social justice movements. Go to greenleft.org.au slash support to help us out. Your support is greatly appreciated. And thanks to Sean Valenzuela for the music you heard in this podcast. You can find his work by going to at Little Archer Beats or clicking the link in the description. And remember to follow at Greenleft online on social media for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening.